<laughs> um, okay, so uh, here we go. So thank you everyone for joining the Cannabis Chemistry Subdivisions um, Monthly Journal Club. We are very excited and grateful to have Dr. Alexandros Macrianis presenting on cannabinoid receptors, structures, functions, and history. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Dr. Macrianis' work, um, he has generated uh, many, many useful compounds and research, the AM series. Uh, I like to brag about him having synthesized more compounds than Meshulam. <laughs> but, but Macrianis uh, joined Northeastern University in 2005 as the chair in the pharmaceutical biotechnology and director of their Center for Drug Discovery. He's a professor of both chemistry and chemical biology and pharmaceutical sciences. And in 2012, he was named to the ACS Division of Medicinal Chemistry Hall of Fame. That's right, a Hall of Famer is here today to share his work and his ideas with us. So many of his compounds with this AM designation that I mentioned are among the most popular pharmacological probes and tools used by the scientific community. Definitely uh, his compounds were part of my work on my thesis with the cannabinoid receptors. So it is really just great to have him here. Um, and his work in drug discovery has generated a lot of proprietary drug candidates that target the cannabinoid signaling both directly and indirectly. So Cannes Journal Club is the only international journal club of this kind, and it focuses on recent peer-reviewed publications in the cannabis science space and is open to the public. We hold these sessions monthly and broadcast them, as you can see, by webinar. We'll have a live Q&A after this, so please submit your questions as they come to you. All right, and with that, Dr. Alex Macrionis, please take it away. Thank you, Jamie, for the nice introduction. And uh, so I'll, I'll talk to you. Can you hear me clearly there? You sound terrific. Good. So I'd like to talk to you uh, from the beginnings of the cannabis story very briefly and come to today where we have now targets and we have footprints with which we can design new compounds. So as we all know, the and uh, I'd like to, to uh, also make sure you understand I'm a founder of Max Scientific LLC and Paphos Pharma LLC. They're both licensed from the two universities I've participated in, University of Connecticut, now Northeastern University, and we're in the process of advancing and developing new drugs there. Now to start, uh, this is the leaf. You all know about the leaf, and the leaf uh, has been the symbol of uh, what's going on. And and the next important thing is delta-9 THC, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which is a terpene. It, is, it has uh, three rings, a tricyclic ring and a tail. And this, of course, is the leaf. This is reproduced. This is computationally determined. And we'll see that it's an important part of the story. Now, the story started before the receptors were discovered. Uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse was trying to revitalize what's going on in the cannabis field. The story with the cannabis field in the West started before that, and it started with great interest in people in England. They were trying to see whether they could make these substances into drugs, and they had been working very hard. In fact, they've been doing a fair amount of chemistry at the time, and uh, they had uh, done a lot of tests also in animals, However, by the, until then, there was no indication of how these compounds work. So the National Institute of Health within the NIDA, National Institute on Drug Abuse, decided they want to put, put a, a strength behind the activities of around cannabis. And they asked me to help them organize a meeting where we would get all the workers scientists in the field of cannabinoids and we got together in DC and we started talking there. We actually get to know each other and there were a lot of people from industry. Pfizer was very well represented. We also had people from other industries and also some of the key members working on the cannabinoid field. By the end of the conference, a lot of people had met each other 
and there was some energy instilled there. And as a result of that, this uh, paper came out, it's actually a booklet, which is called the Structure Activity Relationship of Cannabinoids. And because of that, because of that encounter, uh, Pfizer volunteered to take one of their compounds and triviate it. And it was given to a lady by the name of Ellen Howlett, who did, developed a binding assay for the cannabinoids. This was pivotal because up to then there was no way of measuring or whether there is anything, uh, any protein that's associated with the cannabinoids. And sure enough, uh, that produced then the first indication that there is a cannabinoid receptor. At the same time, there was a group at NIH, a gentleman by the name of Miles Herkenham, very well known for his work on during neuroanatomy. So he would take slices from the brain of an animal, in this case a rat, and then use these radioligands to image it and do neuroimaging, autoradiography. And as you can see here, the neuro the autoradiography indicated where these receptors are present. So that was uh, very interesting. At the same time, there was another lab there at the NIH. That lab was trying to find new receptors. And they had found one receptor that has similar footprinting as the radioactive labeled uh, slice you see here. And that then took them to the point of getting the uh, details from that uh, situation, and they were able then to clone the receptor. That's how the receptor was cloned. And they was cloned very close to each other. Within a year, both of these things had done. They actually, the labs were very close to each other. It was a very fortuitous explanation. At the same time, we had been working on these cannabinoids, and up to then, we didn't know whether there's a protein there, keep in mind, Yes, there was evidence of a protein, but it hadn't, hadn't been shown. So we decided to make it into a radioactive target. And we were able then to detect it on a gel and know now that that particular uh, receptor was in fact within the brain of the animal we were talking of. We had been doing these, uh, these uh, experiments with the Dr. Sumner Burstein, and we were doing them in mouse. <clears throat> so here it was, then the receptor had been discovered. We have a target with which we can now create new molecules, and we can then tailor the targets, tailor the molecules the way we want. So among the compounds we made at the time, this is delta-8 THC. See, this is the tricyclic ring and the five carbons, and we made the delta-8, the delta-9 has a double bond right here, the delta-8 has a double bond there. The reason we made the delta-8 uh, is because delta-8 is more stable. It's actually, you should know that delta-8 THC has almost the same efficacy as delta-9 THC, almost, but it is considerably more stable. So we made photo affinity labels and we were able to see the band there, which corresponds, this is, one part of the band and the other was right here. Now we saw a second band here and we thought that this, there may be more than one receptor. And this was the first indication that there is a CB2 receptor. So this is how we got into the business of identifying the receptors. Now, at that time, we started then doing a lot of work and we said, we're going to approach it in two different ways. We're gonna make ligands and develop ligands so we can explore the endocannabinoid system, make them available to pharmacologists, etc. But at the same time, we wanted to work with the receptors themselves because we wanted to know how these ligands fit into the receptor. So we have then been working in the lab, trying to identify the receptor here in, in cell lines or in animals. And in this case, what we did then, some work, and we showed that one of the endogenous ligands, the endocannabinoids bind to this receptor in exactly that format. This was all done experimentally. This is all experimental approaches and 
We know now actually that this molecule here, which is nothing else but anandamide itself, binds to helix six right here, and the tail of anandamide interacts with the cysteine in helix six. It is now history, but this is how the receptor gets activated. So we talked about the phytocannabinoids, and I did mention that delta nine THC is a key phytocannabinoid or delta eight THC. Now the endocannabinoids come in two kinds because we don't have THC in our body. We have these endocannabinoids and they are of two families. One family of them is an amide and this is the anandamide, arachidonyl ethanolamide. And the other is an ester, it's called acylglycerol, two arachidonyl glycerol. And both of these have work on both receptors and they have somewhat different indications. So depending on where they are produced and depending on where they activate the receptor, they may have a different profile. But together they form the endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system, the endocannabinoid uh, proteome is, includes these two compounds but also it includes a variety of other molecules, but the two key endocannabinoids are these two. So as I mentioned, we had already started making compounds just to produce uh, these tools with which the uh, scientists, pharmacologists could work. And the first of these tools was discovered by Sanofi by compound SR141716A, a it was the first CB1 selective antagonist. And Gerard Lefeur, who was at the time head of research, was very excited about it. And they were planning to make a drug out of it. They worked very hard for that. And you'll see later how they encountered some difficulties. In the meantime, we were also working in this field. We created our own molecule, which is AM251 just as good as the SR. In fact, a lot of people like to use it because it's available commercially. So that was one of the first tools that was discovered at the time. Very, very soon after that, we had been working on the CB2. In fact, at the time we had inklings that there is a CB2, but we didn't see it yet. But when we discovered this other compound, AM630, it turned out the first CB2 selective antagonist. So we have two now very good tools, AM251, AM630, or SR141716A. Now, how do we work in the lab? Just to give you a clue about how we operate, we like to make compounds, but we, make, we like to make compounds by designing them, make them fit where they have to fit, tailor them, and make them do what we want them to do. To do that, we use a combination of chemistry and biology. And I give you an example here. This is a molecule that we have made. It's called AM411. Actually, it turns out to be the first cannabinoid, the first delta-9 THC-related compound to be crystallized. And a nice idea, et cetera. And we also cloned the receptor and had it in the lab so we could play around with it. And also we could purify the receptor, do gel chromatography on it, do different things. So we work by doing marriage between chemistry and biology. Now, let me, let me take a minute and go over this because this condenses the function of the two cannabinoid receptors. The first thing we should know is that these receptors, the CB1 and CB2, occur presynaptically. This is the synapse here. This is the presynaptic cleft. This is the postsynaptic cleft. And you see that both CB1 and CB2 are presynaptic. So they get activated by endogenous compounds that are produced postsynaptically. They go and interact with the receptor and produce the different effects. Now, the endogenous compounds that interact with these receptors are produced in the cell membrane. And there's a variety of enzymes here, and these produce these endocannabinoids. And these endocannabinoids then go to the presynaptic through the cleft here and interact and activate the CB1 and the CB2. Now, once these molecules do their job 
in activating the receptors, they have to be a way of deactivating them. And once they finish this stuff, and to do this, there are two enzymes, key enzymes that operate there. One of them is, a, is an enzyme that deactivates an endamide. It's an amidase. It's called fatty acid amide hydrolase, or FA, very well known today, and is present in the postsynaptic uh, piece of the uh, bone here. And MGL, or monoacylglycerol lipase, in the presynaptic cleft right here. So these deactivate an anamide, these deactivate two arachidonyl glycerol. Additionally, there are other players in the field, and we'll see more about them, but one that's an important player is a transporter. This transporter can take the cannabinoids from outside, from inside the cell to the outside of the cell. And this way they can be then eliminated from inside the cell, and it's a way of eliminating these compounds by getting them out of the cell. Now the structure of this transporter has been debated quite a bit. There's a compound we made called AM404. It's still a very popular compound, but we don't have the full details of how it works. However, we know that these compounds, when given to an animal, they can produce uh, effects equivalent to eliminating, to those produced by eliminating the endogenous cannabinoids. Now, in addition to these, there are other uh, type of uh, proteins that are involved there, there are carrier proteins, and of course, all of these cannabinoids interact directly or indirectly with other receptors here. Now, so we found ourselves in an interesting situation. Uh, we had now the receptors, we could clone them, produce them in cell lines, we could actually get them from brains of animals. And we wanted to know how the ligands interact with the receptors. Well, that turned out to be quite an interesting story. At the time, and especially a little after that, there was a lot of work doing crystallographic studies. And if you were working with enzymes, you could produce crystal structures of an enzyme with a ligand, an enzyme inhibitor or an enzyme substrate, you can produce a crystal structure and get exactly the structure of the enzyme and where the ligand interacts with the enzyme. This turned out to be not the case with the receptors, and the reason is that the receptors are very floppy. They have seven transmembrane helices right here, and you can't get enough effort and time so that you can crystallize them. Because of the movement of these helices, because the receptor is a GPCR, it's a seven transmembrane helical structure, they have to coalesce around themselves so they can crystallize. So the only way you can have them coalesce around themselves is just putting ligands in there. By the time when we started this effort, there was no information at all about where the endocannabinoids or the cannabinoids interact with the receptor. So we developed a method in-house called ligand assisted protein structure or LAPS. So if this is a view of the receptor, we have cut the loops from out of the cell and inside of the cell to make it a little simpler. We knew already that these compounds operated inside the cell membrane right here. And the question is, where do these ligands operate? So we developed this method called ligand assisted protein structure. It's still a very useful method, and I'll talk a little bit about these. And what the method will tell us, which amino acids are critical for the activity of the endocannabinoid system proteins. So we worked on this, and uh, the details of the method are recorded here on a Methods of Enzymology paper, and we see how we can develop this method here. And to do it, we have to express the receptor. And this we can do, as I said, in a, either in a cell line or in a native preparation. Then we have to isolate it and purify it. 
have, then we have to determine the protein primary structure. We do this by mass spec, digest the protein, we determine the amino acid sequence. But then, very importantly, we have made ligands that like these receptors. In fact, they have high affinity for the receptors. And the initial ligands we made were binding covalently to the receptor. So what we do then is we send the ligand, it goes to the active site, it forms a covalent bond with the active site, and our task is to find out where the ligand is. And to do this, we develop then two approaches. One approach is by doing mutations of the different amino acids and finding out which amino acid is the one that when mutated does not form a covalent bond. Or alternatively, we could do it in a chemical way using mass spectrometry. We take the receptor, we put a very high affinity ligand which we develop, ligands that can be 100 times more potent than THC, they form a covalent bond. We isolate that uh, particular uh, preparation there. We isolate the, the complex between the ligand and the receptor. And then, then by doing mass spectrometry, we can find out where it is. And these are some examples. Here is, for example, how we do it. This is a hypothetical molecule. In fact, we made this molecule. It's under one nanomolar, very potent. And then one at a time, we put different groups around the molecule. Each of these groups carries out a, uh, a group that could form a covalent bond with the receptor. So if we put a group right here, in this case, we put an azido group. That azido group could, let's say, form a covalent bond with this group right here. Then if we find and where this group is, we have an indication of where the ligand is in the receptor. But we can play the game in different ways also. We could put two groups there. We have one azido here and one azido. So if you think about it, it can form one covalent bond and one here. It gives us three-dimensional structures already. And together with other uh, physical measurements we make, we can identify where the ligand is. Now, early on, our favorite ligands were two of them here. One of them was an azido group. This is an aliphatic azido group. At that time, aliphatic azido groups were not very popular because they're pretty unstable. But if you then take that group, and it has the azido group here, very high affinity ligand here, as I said, a little under one nanomolar. And if you shine specific light on it, then the azido group throws out in nitrogen ion, a nitrogen uh, molecule, and what is left is one nitrogen, and that nitrogen is a nitrine, becomes a very reactive nitrogen, and that nitrogen forms a covalent bond with what's around it. So if you have already positioned your molecule in the active site, then you can shine light, and sure enough, the molecule then would form a covalent bond with the residue that is closest to it. And that's a way of photoactivating it. Alternatively, we do it in another way, where now we have a group here, which is called an electrophile. It's an isothiocyanate group, NCS. That NCS group is an electrophile. It likes to react with nucleophiles. So we tailored it. So the only nucleophiles in the receptor that would react with the NCS are the cysteines. So now we knew that the cysteines are the ones that would interact with this group here. And our job there was to find which is the cysteine that interacted with NCS. And so how do we do that? Well, we have to, we take each of the cysteines one at a time and prepare different mutants. And then by playing that game, we find out which of these cysteines is involved in the interaction with the receptor. Let's take this molecule here, which is a molecule we like quite a bit. It's an AM841. It has an NCS group here. We do a saturation curve of the receptor preparation. In other words, we put a radio ligand, measure how much of the radio ligand binds to the receptor, and then we pre-treat it with this compound. Once we pre-treat it with a compound, the light radio ligand doesn't bind anymore because all of the sites of the receptor are occupied by this molecule. So we can then do this, and this is our first finding, was AM841 
binds to helix six. In fact, it binds to the cysteine in helix six, 647. That's the one that doesn't get, uh, does not involved in the uh, deactivation of the receptor. And we know now, and this was the first time that was shown, that cysteine in helix six is a very important amino acid because it can bind to the ligand we put in. And we reported that, and this was done in the CB2 receptor, but we did it also with the CB1 receptor and a number of other ways. And I said that we could also do it by mass spec. So here what we do is we take our ligand, we put it in the receptor preparation, it forms a covalent bond right here. We take the receptor, we digest it, and sure enough, we find out where which of these cysteines carries the AM841? It is this particular one, the cysteine that's present in helix 6. And we can then play with the data we have, etc., and we get a picture out of it, which is what we wanted. We want to see how the footprint of this ligand on the receptor, and you see these are the helices, and this is helix 6 right here. And you see right here, 647 has formed a covalent bond with this molecule right here. It's an NCS group. And we have a very nice footprint now. Of course, we have to do some other experiments, but now we have it, we have it point out exactly what it is. So having now a footprint, we can design molecules that could do one thing or another. We could make them do more or less, etc. But now we have a way of knowing how our receptors operate structurally. Uh, we wanted to know how the endogenous ligands operate. Remember the one I put here is a phytocannabinoid variation. It's a cannabinoid. Here we do a, an endocannabinoid. We had to modify it a little bit to make it more potent. That's again, very potent endocannabinoid. To give you an idea, it's about 50 times more potent than an endomide. So we tailored the head group a little bit and we put the NCS group at the tail. And sure enough, it does form a covalent bond just like 841 does. And guess what? Forms a covalent bond with the same cysteine that formed the covalent bond with 841. So now we have a very nice method. We could use this method to explore, and we did explore. We went beyond the use of NCS, developed different ways, but it was a very nice way of obtaining footprinting of the receptor and the ligand. And that's important because this footprinting is done on the receptor that is active receptor. In other words, it's present in the membrane. It's a live receptor. We haven't crystallized. And we were thinking, well, will we be able to crystallize this receptor at some time? Well, let's see how we did it. And this is, we reproduce then the effect. This is the compound, AM3677. We know now how it interacts. Forms a covalent bond right here in helix six. And there it is, it's sitting between helix six and helix three, right there. And how does it activate the receptor? We started thinking of how does it do it? Well, we have a scheme here, which is more of a, an imagined scheme. And here we have helix six and helix three. Now, helix six and helix three are two key helices in the CB1 and the CB2 receptor. And we, may, and we know that helix three and helix six have an attachment between one group in helix six and one group in helix three. In one case, we have an aspartate. The other one is an arginine. Aspartate has a negative charge. Arginine has a positive charge. It forms an electrostatic attraction. When this happens, the receptor is present in an inactive form. Now, when we put our ligand in, then what happens is the ligand does something to the receptor. It produces a conformational change on the receptor. As a result of that conformational change, that helix six, which had the little kink right here, straightens out. And when it straightens out, it breaks that bond right here. And this is how the receptor is activated. This is how we had figured that the receptor would be activated. We did a little more in the lab. We made helix six, see how it is and find out how it gets activated. 
And you see here helix six has a piece there in the middle, which is a soft piece, it's a kink. And we did it by NMR and we did it also by computation. And you see how helix six has a soft middle spot. And this is how the CB1 receptor is activated by turning the two pieces of the helix around. And both CB1 and CB2, but not only that, turned out to be a key piece in many class A receptors, GPCRs. So it was a fortune, fortuitous and fortunate finding. And the piece that's involved, CWXP motif right here. Okay, I talked to you earlier about what we would do if we could crystallize the receptor. And I had mentioned that it was difficult to do that. It took a number of years, but it's only relatively recently, under 10 years now, that the beta adrenergic receptor was crystallized. It was crystallized by uh, Ray Stevens and Kubilka. And actually, uh, Kubilka got Nobel Prize, one of the reasons he got because of that. And we said, maybe we can crystallize the CB1. It turned out to be difficult. It hadn't been done. So we made we made a connection with Ray, Ray Stevens, and we worked hard on it. And we involved also a lab in China, in uh, Shanghai. And uh, sure enough, about three years ago, we were able, three or four years ago, we were able to crystallize the CB1 receptor. I'll show you some of the uh, effects here. Got the crystal structure of the receptor, published it in cell. And you see here the fellow who made this molecule, is Kieran Mori, And this is the molecule we made. So it's an interesting molecule. It has a nitrate group here. And that allowed us then to crystallize the receptor and in its inactive form because this is a CB1 antagonist. See, we keep making crystals that are more and more defined. This is up to here, did a little more. And the person who worked very hard on this was a young woman, very intense, Hua Tian from Shanghai. And she was able to get crystals right there that were able then to form crystal structure. And this is the, our ligand. Without the ligand, the receptor will not crystallize. We had to make a ligand which is suitable to form a crystal structure, and that's what it looks like. And you see where it sits. It sits right here, right there, right here. And we know now by docking it, now we have the structure of the complex. We can then look at which amino acids are surrounding this particular ligand. We know exactly which ones they are. We do a lot of experiments to justify all of these. And we can show that this particular structure can accommodate all of these compounds. These are compounds that had been made by us and others, and they all are accommodated within that crystal structure. Now keep in mind that at the time, we had made the crystal structure of the inactive receptor. Compounds we had made for that were antagonists. Can we make a crystal structure of a compound which is an agonist? And the answer is yes. We did that. Now first of all, this is the a picture of the CB1 antagonist. You see it is sitting right here. This is a molecule of five, 600 molecular weight, and this is a receptor which has a molecular weight of about 50,000. But you see how a small molecule can make big changes on the receptor. Right here, we know now the details of that. There it is, very important piece of the receptor with CY. Very important piece of the ligand. So we decided, let's find out the crystal structure of the agonist, and we got two of them. One of them is AM841. You remember the old eight, AM841 back in the, and then we also, there was also another compound called 11542. They both activate the receptor. They're both pretty tightly bound to the receptor. The fellow who made 841 at the time was Spiros Nikas, excellent chemist working in my lab. And you see here we got crystal structures of these, again the first. And here is how the agonist interacts with the receptor. You see it sitting right here. Both of them, in both cases, the ligand sits in the same position. 
and also in the same conformation. This is how they look. If you take the ligands out of the receptor, this is the shape with which they interact with the receptor. And you'll see that there is, if we go back to the antagonist, you see that they do behave differently than the antagonist. If you recall, and I'll show you this in a minute, that the antagonist sits with all of them in one line. On the other hand, with the agonist, the ligand is two pieces here forming an angle to each other. Here it is, if you put one on top of the other, this is the antagonist. In other words, this ligand puts the receptor in the inactive form. This ligand puts the receptor in the active form. Very subtle changes, but enough to make a very major physiological difference. Here again, to show you the two pieces, this is the agonist, this is the antagonist, and we notice some really drastic changes. There's a 53% reduction in the size of the receptor once you put the agonist in there compared to the antagonist. And we see these conformational changes in great details. We know now how these helices modify and do that. And if we take all of this into account so we can design our new molecules. And we show how an endomide binds also. Now, what I like to do now, I've shown you how the two receptors, the structure of the two receptors have become available. These structures now are footprints for us, so we can develop compounds that can modulate the endocannabinoid system. So I like to give you some tidbits of what type of modulations we could do on the endocannabinoid system. What type of functional effects we have. So I'll give you a few examples uh, just to get a feeling for it. And what I want to talk about is a discovery we made on making CB1 receptor neutral antagonists. And why did we make these? So we all know that obesity is not really a good thing for you because being overweight, you can have high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, heart attack, kidney failure. And Sanofi, when remember they made the SR141716A, they thought, well, that could be a good drug for people to lose weight. And they did, they developed it in Europe, it was approved in Europe, but it was not approved in, in here in the United States. And the reason is because the compound they had developed, which is called Acomplia, has side effects. Side effects it has, nausea and depression. And the way their logic went at the time and their thinking was, it says, well, we all know that when we smoke dope, we get hungry. So if we do the opposite, we're not going to eat. So if we make the agonist then makes you hungry, the antagonist will make you not eat. That was the logic that Sanofi used. And they made this, but at the same time, we were working on this project and we said, well, listen, when you make, when you smoke dope, you get hungry. And if you do the opposite, you don't eat. But also when you smoke dope, you get happy. If you do the opposite, perhaps you get depressed. Is there a way of getting the good things from blocking the receptor and not the side effects? By that time, several companies had made similar compounds. They had taken them into humans, Merck was one of them, and, uh, but they all had made the same style, the same pharmacological profile. We tried to make compounds that have a different pharmacological profile. To a certain extent, we will help, as you see later, from the structure of these receptors. And this is a quick lesson in pharmacology here. So this is a, a, a receptor, and the receptor is activated by cyclic AMP. And cyclic, if you activate the receptor, the level of cyclic AMP goes down. So the agonist of a CB1 produces a reduction in cyclic AMP. And if you have a full reduction, it's called an agonist, full agonist, Part of it is called a partial agonist. The compounds that Sanofi made did exactly the opposite. It was an inverse.
as agonist. In other words, instead of reducing cyclic AMP, it enhanced cyclic AMP. So we thought maybe we could make a compound that sits right in the middle. It will be inactivated only by the endogenous ligands, but the molecule in itself is not going to do anything to the receptor. We call this a neutral antagonist. And this is the road we took to discover and develop the first neutral antagonist. And sure enough, we did this compound AM4113. You see here, if we use the SR compound, cyclic AMP goes up, it means it's an inverse agonist. If we use our compound, cyclic AMP stays flat. So this was the discovery of the first neutral antagonist. Now, we did a lot of work with 4113, and this is a compound that gets in the brain, and we hope that this compound will be used to treat addiction. We see here how this compound behaves differently than SR, because if we compare this GTP, P gamma S, this is a, a real cell. SR reduces the cyclic, the GTP gamma S, our compound does not. And then we tested it in animals. Now this is the accomplia, and accomplia when you feed it to a rat, you'll find that it reduces the amount of food it takes. However, it also produces nausea which is dose dependent. Let's try our compound. Our compound also reduced the amount of food taken but had no nausea, no side effects. So this was an important discovery. We worked very hard on that and we have done a lot of tests. But addition, and you see here it works, for example, for nicotine addiction and it works for uh, cannabis addiction because there is addiction of cannabis, certainly for certain people, and also uh, heroin self-administration. It has an effect on heroin self-administration. Very useful compound. And also, this is more recent work. We find that it works extremely well in alcohol consumption, binge-like alcohol consumption. This is work, there's one paper published already, but we hope that this compound will end up being a good compound for treating alcoholic conditions, binge-like alcoholic conditions. So in summary then, the SR compound here uh, had emesis in ferrets, which is a nausea effect. Our compound does not. It produces anhedonia. Doesn't like to eat sugar, doesn't like to feel well. Compound does not. It produces depression using the immobility for swim test, our compound does not. And it produces anxiogenic effects, our compound does not. So this is then the story of the CB1 neutral antagonist. And before leaving the story, I just wanted to tell you the remainder of the story. The remainder of the story is that Sanofi had done a lot of tests with their compound in humans. And they found that a lot of the effects of CB1 antagonists was done because they had effects peripherally. They did have both centrally and peripherally, but a lot of the side effects were like nausea, were peripheral effects. So we decided at the time we're going to make also a compound that doesn't get in the brain. And we made a compound that doesn't get in the brain. In fact, we made a compound that was both neutral and peripheral and has become a good compound for us, AM6545. And you see this compound does a lot of good things and it also peripherally acting. And you see compound does not elicit signs of nausea in rats. So it does not have the effects that cannabis, that uh, the Sanofi compound Accomplia has. It also reduces sign of hepatic steatosis. People who have fat in the liver, they, they can be treated by giving them a CB1 antagonist. 
And the reason for that is the liver has a lot of CB1 receptors. And because of the presence of the CB1 in unhealthy conditions, you can produce a lot of fat. And as we'll see, it also produces fibrosis. So our compound reduces the fat. And we have also shown that it reduces fibrosis and steatosis here. Prevents diet induces hepatic steatosis. Again, you see our compound dose dependently reduces that. So I'll give you an example of that. So I'd like to close by giving you a final example of how we could take these indications that we got from the crystal structure of the cannabinoid receptor and what we learned from that and use it for particular pharmacological treatments. So this is the compound 6544 a little bit different than the 841, okay? It's an antagonist. And sure enough, we show that this compound goes into the cell, forms a covalent bond, and stays there. It doesn't come out. It binds covalently. Well, if it binds covalently in the cell, then it inactivates the CB1 receptor. This is a special property, and this was used to show that we can inactivate CB1 receptors by binding irreversible ligands there. There's a nice paper by Dr. Michelle Glass and showed how we can study the different types of activation and deactivation of the cannabinoid receptors. In other words, study the signaling mechanisms. The other way, and that's what paper that she done, nice paper. But another way of doing it is putting a compound that is an antagonist, but does not form a covalent bond, but somehow it is irreversible. And this is the same compound with crystallizer receptor. This is a nice compound that can go in the receptor, attach to the receptor without binding covalently and not get out. So one thing we found, that if we take the compound and we give it to, rat, to rats or give it to non-human primates, my colleague, Dr. Paronis, who's at McLean Hospital, did it. And when we put it in the animal, that molecule goes in the air, stays on the receptor, so the receptor cannot function and becomes inactive. We thought, well, it's the same way, the same thing that happens when you do a CB1 knockout. So we call this a chemical knockout. It's actually a very useful approach. We get a lot of requests to send these compounds. A lot of people are working with it. And you see here how in the monkey, it takes about a week to recover the receptor. It's a pretty nice situation. You don't have to make a new genetically engineered comp uh, animal. You could just knock out the receptor chemically and you can get the same type of pharmacology from it. Um, another one of these irreversible ligands, which we used, 841. 841 is a peripheral compound. We've seen it in the, in the structure of the agonist here. And it works on GI. This is with my colleague, uh, Dr. Storr. And they put it in the GI. That molecule then goes in the GI, again, blocks the receptor. And as a result of this, you can see how the molecule now inactivates the CB1 receptor at very, very small doses. In fact, it can inactivate, I'm sorry, it can activate the CB1. Keep in mind, we're talking now of a CB1 agonist. CB1 agonist activates the receptor. The compound I showed previously inactivated the receptor. So the CB1 agonist now activates the receptor. So what is so remarkable about this molecule? What's remarkable is that this compound can activate the receptor in very, very small concentrations. 10 micrograms, very potent. We call it a mega agonist. So I think 
I've consumed my time. I had more things to tell you about. Maybe at another time we'll do that. So I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and thank my colleagues here. Let's see if I can go fast. I'll show you the picture of, of my lab here and thank them. Oh, let's see. Because we also did, the, did this a CB2 structure. And sure enough, there they are. So we worked with them and so on. There's a lot to say about the cannabinoids. There's a lot to say about the cannabinoid system. I touched just a little bit about it. But suffice to say, that by learning how these molecules operate, by finding how these molecules and where these molecules operate, we can design molecules. We don't want to just go and make compounds willy-nilly and see which one sticks. We do target-based design. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank my colleagues. This is an all the taken picture. Thank you. I'll take any questions you may have. Um, thank you, Alex. That was a wonderful and beautiful presentation. I've personally, I really like those 3D uh, movies of the receptor. Um, we have a couple questions, but I saw a slide in your deck that you didn't have a chance to talk about, and it's one that I I've been curious about. It's the picture of the yin and yang symbol with CB1 yes. and CB2. Yes. Could you yes. interpret what they mean or what the researchers meant by putting that together? Because I've received some questions on that too. Sure. Thank you, John. Yeah, that's a very good question. And actually, it's a question that occupies, uh, occupies us now, etc. And how does CB1 and CB2 interact? And it turns out that they have some of the roles they have in our body are very similar. Some of the roles we have are opposite. And we know that we had a glimpse of that when we did the structure of CB2, because I didn't talk about it, but we also did the structure of CB2. And we found that we could make some compounds. And as I said, you know, we can target them. Now we know the structures, we can play around with them. So we made compounds that can activate one receptor and deactivate the other. So that's what I call yin yang. On the other hand, we make compounds that activate both receptors. So that was, and I use the term yin yang when we describe the structure of the CB2, inactive CB2 compound, because the compound we used to inactivate CB2 can be used to activate CB1 but we have different situations. But I will give you a live example here of how in practice this can be used. Take, for example, a very interesting case of uh, fibrosis or interesting case of dysfunctional organs in the body. I'll identify the uh, liver and the kidney and maybe the lung. It turns out that you can work with these and reduce the effects because these things happen at a time when the organ is functioning beyond its homeostatic state. And because it's non-homeostatic, there's an overexpression of CB1. So you can then uh, replace this and reduce all of this by putting CB1 antagonists. At the same time, you could cure a lot of the ill effects of these molecules, of these uh, organs, by using a CB2 agonist. And you can use a CB2 agonist to do similar situations as the CB1, but do it in a different way. Now, exactly how this is reflected in the structure of the receptors, we don't exactly know. But I think I gave you a very general idea of how you can make molecules that can do one thing with one and another thing with the other. We like this. We're working very hard on this. Does this answer your question, John? I, th I think so. Thank you. Um, definitely give me something to think about. Yeah, yeah. If you have any thoughts, tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe later. Um, we had a question um, from someone who asked, what is the typical organic structure relationship of the cannabinoids? Um, do you have a simple answer for that one or is it? <laughs> come, come again, tell me. 
I didn't I'm not sure that. if I understand it entirely, but it's, it was, what's the typical organic structure relationship of the cannabinoids? I guess, is there an underlying philosophy or sure. theme when sure. building the structure? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something very simple. There's, there's many things to say about that because we've been playing with these structures for a long time, but I can tell you one thing that, that works every time. You know that, that five carbon chain there? Five carbon chain. Mm -hmm. If you take it and cut two carbons out of it, then you make another group of cannabinoids, right? Which are also in cannabis and they are much weaker. On the other hand, if you synthesize cannabinoids and make that tail longer, you could make seven carbons or eight carbons, it becomes much stronger. Okay. And if you, uh, like, say, add functional groups, like methyl groups to that tail, so increase uh, potency as well? It could. It could, depending on where you put it, et cetera. Then you come into details. Mm. But the general rule is once you enhance the, the, the length of the, of the tail, uh, up to seven or eight carbons. Once you go past that, you start having the reverse effects. But once you go to there and... Uh, and you know okay. the endogenous ligands that are in the, the cannabis that have three carbons, right? Yeah. Um, so that makes sense for agonists that you would increase the tail. Um, what about uh, for antagonists? Is there a simple philosophy you have there about increasing or decreasing potency of antagonists? No, you just uh, study the structures we put out with the crystal structure. <laughs> in the labs. Okay, I mean that's one of the helps. because okay. you can really you could do a lot of docking there, and you can get a lot mm. of information from that. Okay, good. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, in the beginning you showed these uh, brain slices um, with the radiographic ligands. Um, I wanted to ask about the abundancy of cannabinoid receptors uh, compared to maybe serotonin, opioid, or dopamine binding sites, um, how abundant, in your opinion, are um, cannabinoid receptors in the brain? Very nice question. And for all of you, all of you who are participating there, these I would call cannabophiles. The cannabophiles, CB1 is number one, is the most abundant receptor in the brain. Excellent. That's, uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, okay. Uh, we had um, a, a question coming in by an anonymous person <laughs> that says, um, asked about the, selective, uh, the selectivity of CB1 antagonists or agonists, and they're curious if they act on any other known receptors. So you might have had something that was very specific for CB1 over CB2. Um, well, like maybe um, Ramona Bant or um, SR141716A, does it have targets at other receptors, like a GPR? Yeah, yes, it does. It does. Keep in mind that, generally speaking, all lipid-related receptors are pleiotropic. So it's not unusual to find ligands that operate in more than one receptor. For example, 251 and SR work on GPR55, okay, and some other receptors, too. They work on, on the, on the uh, VR1 uh, again. Uh, also, especially the lipids, the endogenous lipids, you find that these can operate in more than one receptor, etc. But for, for the 251 and SR, I would say there's, in terms, if you look at the affinity and the potency, the biggest selectivity is with CB1. Okay. Um, very interesting. Um, have you, uh, this is a, another this is totally different topic, but in the course of your work synthesizing many compounds, have you ever synthesized something that you later discovered in nature or that the body was metabolizing or anything like that? Um, you know, sometimes this happens in science. And I was just wondering if you had ever made a compound that was later discovered um, either in another plant or as part of drug metabolism or something like that. Sure. Well, it happens. You know, it happens. One one interesting story was a story with the M404, which was found to 
to be involved as a uh, as a product of taking one of the NSAIDs, COX-2 inhibitor. So it turned out to be an interesting story. Uh, it wasn't exactly made a, a, in, in the body in that particular way, but it was involved in the metabolism of a COX-2 inhibitor. Okay. Uh, did I find other? Sure, you know, when you, when we, for example, we made all of these uh, endogenous ligands and put deuteriums on them, etc. There's a lot of them that are around there. So it would be no surprise to find many of these ligands. As far as the synthetic cannabinoids, probably not as, as frequent. But with the lipids, okay. you get a lot of those. Okay. Um, the muta when you talk about receptor mutation, you know, uh, many people's imagination thinks of mutations that occur naturally or over the course of life. Have you had the opportunity or your colleagues to study some of the polymorphisms or mutations of CB1 receptors that occur in human populations? And, or do you have any insights on how that might, you know, if there are mutations that exist in mammals in CB1 or CB2 that affect ligand activity? Yeah. Uh, it's a very good question, actually. And there has been a fair amount of work on that for receptors. In, uh, and these receptors are accompanied by certain physiological changes. Some disease, for example, Huntington's chorea is associated with some mutations in the CB1 receptor. But the most interesting one that happened very recently is in the fatty acid amide hydrolase. I didn't talk about the enzymes that deactivate the receptors, but one of them, and a lot of them, a lot of you have heard about them, the far receptor and the far receptor when you make the antagonists of these they're purported to be analgesic so we made some of these and and others have made some of these and and Pfizer had came close to putting one of these in, out in the clinic and so on however uh, very recently it was discovered that a woman had a mutation in far and that woman felt no pain so that's it yeah, yeah, it's in science and so on. I will, you should look for it, etc. It's a very interesting story. Wow, that is um, fascinating. Um, I knew the cannabinoid system had a role in pain, but that is that is quite dramatic. Um, we had a another medicinal chemistry question for you um, from Eric Miller, and he is asking regarding the straightening of the kink motif and going from the inactive to active state of a cannabinoid receptor. Do you see much potential in proline mutant studies based on inherent uh, kinkiness therein? <laughs> um, so I guess he's asking about sort of the proline uh, mutant um, receptors and their usefulness. Uh, does the question uh, make sense to you? Well, what we know is that helix six has a soft spot in helix six. And there's a proline involved in that quartet there of amino acids. And they, uh, and, and, and uh, you could, it, it's, a, it's a motif which is, which is quite prevalent. And additional data that have come out, and some of them in more recent, more recent work, show that this is where the deformation of the receptor happens, in that particular spot of helix six okay um great great um just a couple more here um there was a, a poster someone saw at a conference about um cannabis uh products um undergoing manufacturing where they saw conversion of delta nine to delta eight and, and as a chemist or you know you have a rich chemistry background how easy would it be to convert delta nine to delta eight? Is this something that could be occurring in theory by accident or is it very difficult uh, to do? Uh, it's not difficult to do and it can happen by accident or by heat or whatever. It can also happen in the lab because uh, delta nine is less stable than delta eight. So if you can induce these changes of the double bond, you can go from delta nine to delta eight. It's a little trick here to go from delta eight to delta nine. But going from delta nine to delta eight, yes, you can do that. Uh, there's several methods for doing it. 
Okay. Um, we had a, uh, we have kind of a, a philosophical public health question here. Um, you know, there's a lot of researchers who have developed these tools and they, some of these tools and probes that you and your colleagues and many other people have developed have been uh, hijacked by, um, let's say, designer drug, you know, illicit drug people. Um, do you have, um, I, I guess I say, is there a compound that you would say, I wish I didn't synthesize it? Do you have, you ever, do you have a compound like that that you wish was not synthesized? Or, um, you know, or, or do you have any comment on this question? <laughs> sure. No, I think it's a very good question. And, it is, and it's a question that I have faced several times. In fact, I should say that we own patents of some of these most potent compounds. But I should say that the purpose for which we synthesized these molecules was not to make them more potent, make them more addictive. We synthesized them. In our initial intent was to make to make uh, uh, to make uh, get pictures of these molecules, to make mm. it as imaging agents, and that was the initial intent for it. Now, some of these imaging agents, especially the ones with the fluorine in the tail, there ended up very potent. Of course, no one could predict how these could be used. So, am I sorry about it? I can't say I'm sorry because you know, eventually everything's going to be discovered. So, <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, however, I, I just caution people to stay away from them. Right. Um, as someone pointed out, um, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, but, you know, there's a f the flaws of uh, a few people cannot outweigh the needs of this for science and, and moving society forward and our understanding of nature. So th yeah, thank you. Be yeah. <laughs> um, so steering back into a couple more science questions. Um, and uh, one is uh, when Hao Ren has asked for you to comment more on the peripheral effect of an agonist or antagonist for the CB1 receptor. If you could just um, talk about, you know, I mean, maybe even just start with a simple, what happens, you know, when you have a res peripherally restricted agonist or antagonist, you know, obviously when it goes into the brain and you have an agonist, you get hungry, maybe a little sleepy, but you don't feel those same effects when it goes into the periphery. Um, so could you comment on the peripheral effects of sure. peripherally restricted agonist and antagonist? Sure. Well, I think each of these have different roles, but the CB1 peripherally acting CB1 antagonist uh, is a very useful tool because the uh, expression of CB1 receptor especially the overexpression of CB1 receptors, is associated with many uh, conditions of non-hemostatic conditions with many diseases. So if we can, then, so if you're normal, then you don't have to worry about these diseases like steatosis or fibrosis or problems in the lung or problems of the kidneys. However, when you do have these, uh, then you are, you are uh, obligated to deal with them. And one way to deal with them is to reduce the numbers, reduce the effects of CB1. And this can be done by peripherally acting CB1 because the centrally acting CB1 effects, you know, can have some, uh, as we've seen, and as Sanofi has seen, uh, can have some deleterious effects. So that's where the peripherally acting CB1 receptors can be useful. Now we have combined this, made them not only peripherally acting, but also we made them neutral antagonists. So this eliminates the ill effects on both sides. Very Does this answer the question in part? I, I believe so. I think that answers um, the, the, the question. Um, uh, 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 when how ran, if that answers your question, let us know. Uh, but in we have time for probably two, two and a half questions. Uh, we got another one. Uh, one house is yeah, exclamation point answered the question. So great job. Um, one of the, this is I think a great question for you, Alex, as a Hall of Famer, someone who's a member of the Hall of Fame at the American Chemical Society. 
what was the most surprising moment uh, throughout your research regarding the endocannabinoid system? Was there a big uh, aha moment or something that really surprised you? Um, and this is coming from Luke Corey, uh, who attended the presentation. Well, I think what's nice about the cannabinoid system, and that's why I like it, it always has good surprises. So I live with a lot of surprises there and keeps me going. So I, I mean, there's a lot of high points there, but uh, many. Oh, that's, uh, that's beautiful. I, I appreciate that too. I definitely, um, when I was doing the molecular pharmacology, it was almost addictive to mutate the amino acids and see what would happen next and what would happen with this drug or that drug. Um, so I can definitely relate. And I think many of the chemists attending here um, can relate to that feeling of sort of excitement and discovery. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share with our attendees? We had over 40 people uh, attend this webinar. Um, you know, is there any, you know, if, uh, if you have any advice for young researchers, we do have a lot of um, people who are in between graduate and graduate school looking at a career in cannabis or cannabinoid sure. research. Sure. Well, you know, uh, I, uh, I, I like to, to divide the work. It shouldn't really be divided. But I like to divide it into cannabis and cannabinoids. In other words, with cannabis, there's a huge new field that's opening up. It's a wonderful field. I see there's going to be a lot of interesting questions coming up. On the other hand, the endocannabinoid system is already going the mature side. Many things to happen here. So for those of you who are pursuing research in neuroscience, chemistry, and so on, going on the endocannabinoid field is a good field. I think there's many new discoveries to be made there. Is by no means fully mature, so you can really work there, get good ideas, and the physiology that is regulated by the cannabinoid system is very broad. It's a very nice and fertile way. On the other hand, with cannabis, it's a new field, and it's a field which is now filled with excitement. And with the excitement comes also money. So... <laughs> So, so I think, I think it's, it's very exciting because new things are happening there. But I think it's very important we maintain the standard of it. We want to keep science at a good level because it's going to help everyone with all motivations, keeping the science at a good level. I would recommend avoiding, avoiding what I would call the parascientific approach. In other words, not really fully uh, accountable. So uh, it's my two cents. I, I think that is wonderful. And that's also the mission of the cannabis chemistry subdivision is to um, use cannabis science for the benefit of all mankind or humankind. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marcarianos, for your time and putting together this wonderful presentation for us. This is a truly an in-depth dive into the world of cannabinoids and we hope to have you back uh, again to give us an update uh, about your future work. Thank you so much. Uh, many of our attendees have thanked you uh, in the chat box for your presentation. Um, well thank you John and you've seen of course the world on both sides and it's great to have you and uh, thank you attendees there and if anyone has any questions or so on, please feel free to write me. All right. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We're going to close out uh, the webinar shortly.